Okay. Here. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Always have trouble with it when I put it into presentation mode, so I may just leave it like this. Um, let's see. Ooh, updated slides. Yeah, no, they're, they're the same slides, <laughs> oh. <laughs> but a little bit different, uh, oh. just with updated logo for everything. Yeah, that's, exactly, yeah, that's what it looked like. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to talk about balanced product teams and how people come together to just build great things. Um, there's a lot of different ways that teams come together, different people that you're gonna work with throughout your career as a developer um, and different positions that you should be aware of kind of what they do. It'll be great to understand who to ask questions to on what those roles are as you continue in your career. So I'm Shelby, uh, I'm a lead experience designer at EPAM. Um, EPAM is a consulting agency that works with some of the top companies all over the world to help them create software. So we put together product teams on our side and uh, deliver great softwares to companies like um, Google, Estee Lauder, um, a lot of different pharma companies and healthcare. So um, kind of a very broad set of clients, but it's a really fun place to work. So what we're going to talk about is what does a product team look like? Uh, what is a product manager? What is a UX designer? Uh, we will take a break if anybody feels like taking a quick break. And then we'll talk about just the process of building a product. Um, so getting started with what does a product team look like? Uh, so we've got three different uh, main areas of expertise that are included on every product team. So this is going to be uh, an engineer. Um, so developer like yourself, uh, you are going to be responsible for the technical feasibility of a product. Um, the third portion of that or second portion is going to be product management. Uh, they're going to be responsible for the business needs, making sure that we have something that's viable uh, in the market, that's gonna make money for the business, um, that's gonna do well and have a roadmap, things like that. And design is gonna be responsible for the user's needs. So is this something that people want to use? Do they enjoy using it? Does it fulfill their needs and wants for what we're trying to accomplish? Um, so these teams, typically, there are many engineers to one product designer and one product manager. These types of teams can grow quite a bit. Uh, I've been on teams with one designer to 20 developers. Um, and I've also been on teams that have this many engineers and have four designers that do each different things and specialize in different areas. But making sure that every portion of this is represented is really important throughout a project uh, to make sure that we're making good decisions and have all of the information we need to know that the product is going to succeed. So we do this because balanced teams reduce risk. Uh, when we only have one of these three pillars included in any you know, product conversations, then uh, we're much less likely to succeed as a product because uh, engineering is responsible for answering those questions like, do we have access to the technology that we need? Uh, can we release an MVP in the time that we have? So that timeline, uh, can we just get this done sort of questions? And we, if we don't have that, we obviously have a blank spot for somebody answering those. Um, design is in the conversation to ask, is our solution able to answer user needs? Is it an intuitive interface? Um, do people enjoy using it? Does it look nice? Is it, uh, you know, delightful to use? Um, that's always our goal. And then the product team, those product managers are um, going to be asking things like, do we have a realistic revenue model? And are, are we prioritizing the right features for our product? Um, they're, you know, looking at those 
timelines and saying this is what we need to get done in this amount of time we need you know this portion of market share by this date we need to make sure that we can get this many subscriptions and have these different features or people aren't going to use it um, also really important so all three of these help answer all of these questions that are um, ensure that a product is successful So any questions about just kind of like team setup before we uh, start talking about product managers? No, all right. Um, product managers are really important um, people on every project. This is the person that keeps everything running, um, keeps the team on track, is responsible for really kind of leading the effort. Uh, I love this quote about product managers. It says, a great product manager has the brain of an engineer, the heart of a designer, and the speech of a diplomat. They are often responsible for dealing with stakeholders and uh, the business side and making sure that those requirements from the business are being met, but also that uh, the technical feasibility is there and that the designers have everything they need from talking to users to you know, feeling enabled to make a really great product. Um, you know, they dabble in a little bit of everything because they are coordinating all of it. Um, so I think like this quote describes what they do really well. Um, they have many responsibilities and you'll hear kind of different titles that have uh, some or more of these responsibilities. There's going to be product managers, product owners, um, business analysts, things like that. You may come across all of these. They all kind of serve this role of um, you know, analyzing what product we want to make and making sure that the cross-functional team um, has everything that they need to be successful. So they're going to be defining the minimum viable product. So what's that first iteration that we're going to make? What features do we need just to get started? Um, what can we build on top of? Uh, they're going to create a roadmap after that to say we're going to start here but we're going to add this quickly then we're going to add this and then we're going to add this and that's going to let the team know what types of things we're going to grow into and maybe um, what types of technologies are going to be appropriate and what we want to think for in the future um, they're going to prioritize the uh, backlog of features so setting task by task goals for the developers to pick up on their own and work uh, as well as reviewing those features to approve them as they go into um, their you know, production releases. Uh, and then lastly, they're going to analyze what we've made and make data-driven decisions on where we should be going next. So they're really responsible for a lot of those analytics, digging into um, making decisions based off of those or working with analytics groups to understand the health of the product, how it's doing, the business behind it, uh, how users are interacting with it, and making those decisions based off of that. So I think this is a great representation of a product manager is responsible for both the, you know, plain minimum viable product of a donut that you can eat. It will, you know, give you everything you need for breakfast. Um, and it's a good donut and it's definitely uh, edible, uh, but it's also responsible for looking to the future and saying, hey, we might also wanna serve chocolate donuts or sprinkle donuts or, you know, strawberry donuts or cake donuts. Um, you know, our user base wants this and listening to them and saying, um, this is kind of where we wanna go in the future. So those more complicated features that uh, maybe aren't just, it's edible. Um, so they're responsible for both of these. So how will you interact with a PM? Um, PMs are someone that developers interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. They're very closely knit with approving their work, asking questions about what's in scope, what's not in scope for different features. Um, they're going to provide the prioritized list of tasks for developers to complete. So that backlog that you pick from to decide what work you're going to do next. Um, after completing a feature, the developer is going to uh, deliver it to the product manager to approve that it meets all of the requirements that were outlined within those tasks. Um, so a lot of times this is stories with acceptance criteria. Um, the product manager is responsible for 
testing that to make sure and approve that it can be released into a production environment. And then product managers are also going to share that roadmap for completion dates, um, features, releases, all of that. They're responsible for that timeline and communicating that to the team, working with the team to communicate that back to the business as well of, you know, our team's working on this. This is about how long it's going to take, getting feedback from the developers on the difficult things that they're hitting, the roadblocks, so that that can be communicated back to the business. Okay, any questions on product managers? Um, one that I get pretty often here is how do you get into this field? Is there a, um, you know, a course that you take to become a product manager? Um, and the answer is really no. Most of the PMs that I know come from either a business background or um, a development a development background and really wanted to get into product management or project management and uh, everybody just kind of ends up there after some experience of um, working on projects and you know kind of wanting to dive into that I heard somebody speak up did anyone want to ask another question I was wondering what MVP stood for. Yeah, uh, MVP is minimum viable product. Um, I like to call it the minimum valuable product as well, because you should be providing value um, with everything that you make. But it's really talking about what is the smallest thing that we can make uh, that delivers value to our user. And so that's where our MVP is usually defined. Um, it is the smallest chunk of you know, features accumulated together that make up a product, um, but it still provides value and someone could start using it. It's something that you build on top of. It's not, you know, what is our product going to be holistically? It's typically, what is our first iteration gonna look like? How are we gonna release something and test it? Things like that. Or feature shift creeps in. Yes. <laughs> yeah. These can often grow in scope quite a bit as you get closer to a deadline. Um, good MVP definition is a really good sign of a good product manager is uh, if they're not trying to grow that during the project, if they're not, uh, you know, constantly saying, well, can we include just a little bit more? Um, you know, defining an MVP is a really hard thing to do, but uh, there are a lot of really great PMs out there that do this really well. So um, as far as, I guess, designing and then kind of planning, you know, what product you're going to do, what is a typical timeline for each step, you know, go from a client wants an app and then you give them the minimum requirement and also you obviously have to design it and kind of see what, what future features they may want, like a general idea, of like how long does each step take? Yeah, um, we'll get into the steps a little bit later in the presentation, but I've experienced everything from, and it really just depends on the project and how much you know about your customer already or your users. Um, if you have, you know, really solid ideas of why you want to do this product, um, why you want to make this, if, you know, you've got customer surveys coming out the wazoo that say, I want this feature, it's very easy to say, okay, well, we probably don't need to do a ton of discovery into it. We may want to talk to users a little bit to understand holistically what they want, but we've got a good idea or there's a lot of um, existing experience, just expectations around that. So it's easy to just kind of design up front. Um, so the design can take anywhere from, you know, two weeks, four weeks. It can take months also to do a really uh, in-depth research discovery where you're like, I don't know what we should make. Um, let's you know, just figure out what our customers want and then we'll narrow it down from there and figure out what's, you know, our next best step. And that can also take, you know, a couple of months to define, to do enough research into the market, to talk to enough customers to get a, um, you know, statistically significant number of voices to say, I want this thing where it's gonna be a good investment. Um, so it can, it can take anywhere. Um, I've done four week, discovery projects where it's, you know, pretty set and defined and we've got a design ready to go out of four weeks. And I've done projects where it's taken three months to 
figure out what design we should be doing. So. So during that process of kind of figuring out what the user wants and whatnot, are you, are you almost kind of like a liaison with the user and going back to your engineers to see what's viable during that process while you're doing yeah. it? Yeah, I'm going to leave that question for a little bit later because I'm going to talk through the whole process and how each role um, interacts with each other during it. So um, if you don't get an answer to that a little bit later, um, speak up and we can talk more about it. Awesome. Any other questions on product managers? I'm gonna to go to uh, UX designers. All right. Um, so product design, uh, these are also called user experience designers, UX designers, user, user, user interface designers. Um, there's a lot of different titles. It's a very new position in most companies. Uh, so you'll hear it different in almost every place. Um, but these are people that are responsible for the user experience of a product. So what is user experience? Um, this is something as a UX designer myself, I get asked all the time because people usually don't know. Um, so it's much more than just what a site looks like. It's not just defining buttons should be this color or you know this is the font that we're going to use. Um, it's really about how someone's going to interact with your product. Um, so design, if you were just doing design would be this lovely sidewalk that is, you know, very uh, got great angles and, you know, the um, street is laid very well, but really what we're looking for are those quickest paths to what somebody wants to do. We're um, looking for ways that users want to interact with something rather than building something that they have to do these kind of workarounds with to, um, you know, walk their own path to wherever they're trying to go. Um, they want to get there the shortest way possible, and that's what we're trying to build. And so it's a lot of talking to users and understanding what is the most intuitive, no-brainer sort of thing that they want to do, um, rather than designing something that's just beautiful. So our responsibilities as product designers is to talk to the users understand their needs and really be their voice throughout a project. Um, we're going to do a lot of user interviews. We're, you know, we want to be in the room with the people that are going to be touching the product, using it on their phone, using it on their um, desktop computer, understanding how and when. Uh, we want to do ethnographic studies, which are just observation in their actual, you know, habitat sort of uh, interviews of following someone throughout a store for their shopping experience or sitting by at home with them side by side while they're shopping for something. Um, I've gone into labs with, uh, you know, technicians before in the healthcare industry to watch them do their job to see, you know, what difficult things having gloves on changes an experience of how large your touch areas on a touch screen need to be when you're wearing gloves versus not. Um, there's a lot of, you know, just uh, in environment factors that can change what an experience should be and what they need to access. So we want to do those types of studies as well. Um, we're responsible for persona definition. So taking a wide look at all of users and narrowing them down into kind of generalized people. Um, so saying 30% of our users are of this age group. Um, they work in this field. They are this type of roles, things like that. And they have these needs. So a persona is gonna include what their pain points typically are for big groups of users, um, people that, you know, have a pain point of, I need to do this for my job every day and I can't do it. We would group all of those people together if it's a significant number and say, okay, we've got a person persona here that we're going to try to solve to try to solve these needs for them. And so we look at them in a more generalized way to make sure that we're keeping those people in mind throughout the journey of designing. And then lastly, what most people know UX designers for is prototype creation. So creating what that looks like, what the experience is, what all of those beautiful screens are and how they connect to each other. Um, the interaction design between buttons of hover states, the text sizes, links, things like that. So all of that gets grouped under that as well. But the responsibilities of a product designer are much more vast than just 
here's what your product looks like. It's about understanding your users and being able to speak for them and their needs. Um, when we're having those conversations about what feature should we be doing next, you know, the UX designer is going to have a huge opinion on what the user would want next versus what the business would want next. And that's where the product management and um, product designers are going to, uh, you know, come to some um, conversations about what we should be doing is, you know, users want this versus the business wants this. Let's lay out, you know, what are the benefits of both of these. Um, so we're responsible for talking to different things that are important to the product. So how will you interact with a designer? Um, while designs are being created, uh, developers are often brought in to answer questions about feasibility. So there's a lot of that uh, uh, working together and making sure that uh, the solution that I've created when I work with developers is the easiest one to implement as well. A lot of times I talk to my developers and they have a different idea for what would have been easier to implement or saying, you know, tabs would have been a better interaction here because we've already got that component created versus a different uh, way of navigating maybe accordions and things like that. So working with them to understand what's going to take the least amount of effort to get the best experience. Designers are gonna provide that prototype. Um, so you will see uh, some design tools that uh, you can click through and um, just uh, give you really great specs for um, what you should be building for it as a developer. So it'll tell you type sizes and um, spacing in between things and uh, all of that. So there are some really great tools out there that the designers use to pass that off and correlate it to the list that the product manager is creating of those uh, prioritized tasks. So implement this thing this way. And then after completing features, uh, developers often pair with designers to make sure that the experience matches what the designer's vision was. So looking side by side with those mockups or maybe saying this actually feels really strange to me. Uh, the spacing isn't right now that I'm seeing it on the screen or, you know, this typeface maybe doesn't look exactly the same on my desktop as it does rendered in the web. So let's adjust some type sizes or something like that. Um, I work side by side with developers really often to make sure that um, what got implemented feels right and feels clean like what is supposed to be used. So. Um, and some of, sometimes this is compromised. Sometimes it's, hey, we've already spent an hour trying to style this this way. Uh, and it's gonna take us another probably five to actually do this. Is this an important component to this design or could we simplify this interaction? And so doing compromises like that with developers, making sure that they understand that, you know, the vision for the design should also match the scope that we've outlined. And so um, there's always kind of that give and take with actually implementing something. So any questions on product designers? This is something you can go to school for. Um, I went to school as a graphic designer with a you know, focus in web design. I learned to code with HTML and CSS through my school. Um, so that I would be informed of what's possible with design. There are also boot camps just like this uh, that you can um, go to to learn about uh, experience design and UX in general. Um, but it's also something that with a portfolio and some hard work you can get into without any training. So also an easy one to jump into. Okay. Um, so I've got a five minute break set here. Uh, would anybody like to take a break or do we wanna push through getting uh, through the rest of the presentation? I can't okay for see either. everybody. Um, I'm, I'm here, I'm down. Like if, if everyone's willing to continue, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I don't need it. Okay. Yep, same here. Okay, anybody wanna speak up if they would like a break? All right, no takers. Um, so we'll keep going. I, I do We're have a question. Oh, yeah. Um, in, in terms of tools that are used for like 
uh, laying out and kind of like sketching all um, d- d- design experience. Is that stuff like Adobe Experience Manager or is there like a bigger open source? Yes, their Adobe Experience Manager would be one of them. Um, it connects to Adobe XD, which is a more like greenfield, uh, create what you want sort of experience that plugs into that nicely. Um, there's also Sketch, Figma, and we'll go over some of these later uh, in one of the slides as we get to that point in the process. But there are lots of them. There's a new one almost every year now uh, of different design tools that you could use. So. But uh, my personal favorite would be Figma or Sketch. Um, Figma's great because it's free and you can get like three projects for free on it. Um, Sketch costs $100 a year, I think, uh, for a license. And, but Sketch is going to be kind of the oldest, most refined version of any of them. It was the original uh, kind of first tool that was very open source, lots of plugins. Um, it's great to use and it's almost impossible to make something that you couldn't code, uh, which is my favorite thing about it over Photoshop or something like that is it only allows you to make things that can be coded. So um, it's very difficult to make something that a developer would be like, you know, uh, this is actually really difficult. <laughs> so it's not impossible, but it is a little more difficult than say Photoshop. But it's really important that the uh, file list is on a mobile. Mobi- All right. Any other questions before we dive into just the process of a project? All right. So there are a lot of different methodologies when it comes to uh, how you're going to go about creating a product. Um, There's Waterfall, Scrum, Agile, Lean. Um, There's a lot of different processes because no team works the same way. Uh, everybody is going to have a little bit of a different preference and you're going to find that people that say they're doing agile are actually doing waterfall. Um, you know, every team is a little bit different in the way that they want to work together, what feels comfortable, what's required by their company to be able to set realistic goals for the year for projections of revenue and things like that versus maybe a startup that doesn't need really strict projections so they can move really fast and in an agile manner. So no team works the same way. Everybody says they're doing one. Uh, nobody wants to be doing waterfall. Uh, we'll, we'll say that. There's very few people that are like, you know what? I'm doing waterfall and I love it. Um, it's almost a bad word now. <laughs> but uh, waterfall does have some pros, you know. Uh, It's a very linear process for building a product. Uh, It takes longer and it focuses on completing a full set of features before releasing to users. So this is going to go from product managers setting very detailed requirements, doing a lot of analysis of the business, passing those requirements along to design, saying design is going to take, you know, as long as they need to really outline the entire experience, create a full experience strategy, all of the really detailed mockups, which they're then going to pass along to development to is going to do coding and then pass that final product on to QA to do testing, which then passes it down to the pipeline to actually get it deployed. And then it goes into maintenance mode after it's launched. So this goes, you know, step by step down the ladder and there's not a ton of collaboration across all of the uh, different um, steps. So I've been a designer on waterfall projects many times, and I've had things where I passed my designs off to my development team and didn't see it implemented for two years. And nobody asked me questions about it after I had handed it over to anybody. So the cons are it takes a long time, and there's a really high risk that uh, that far down the line after these designs have been created, created, that there's something new and that you might've missed your market opportunity for actually releasing that thing. Um, There could be brand new experience expectations based off of that. I've seen designs that were not implemented for six months be outdated. Um, And there's also the risk that somebody else is gonna release what you were trying to release faster than you. Um, So you may completely lose your opportunity for your product. But the pros are is that you get a lot of time to do this. There is a really, you know, dedicated design experience and it's really well thought out. And 
likely all of your questions are answered about everything that should need to be done. And everybody's got their own amount of time that they need to do this. So it does feel a little more stable from a, I've got enough time to do my job standpoint and we aren't moving so fast that things are a little hectic. Um, so there are pros to it. And this type of process really allows us to predict really far in the future what we're going to release so a lot of businesses love this model because they can say i'm going to release this feature on this day and i'm going to expect this out of it uh, and they can do that for years at a time rather than you know months or you know quarters based off of some other methodologies so Agile was the new one that came in um, quite a while ago that said, you know what, we just can't move fast enough. In Waterfall, we really want something that's a continuous process that focuses on iterating on that design in timeframes called sprints. So rather than looking at everything in a year, we're going to look at it in two weeks, four weeks, however long we decide for our team that a sprint is, uh, you know, the best timeframe for us to look at. So we plan, design, develop, test, release, and get, gather feedback in these sprint cycles so that when we learn something, we can pivot really quickly. You know, we get feedback on these things in these time cycles so that we're not waiting months for a release to actually get feedback on the product that we made. So pros are that this reduces a ton of risk. Um, the more often that we get feedback, the less risk we have of releasing our product. And it's easy to switch focus to a new task at the end of a sprint. So if we learn at the end of our two weeks that we made something that nobody wants, well, we only spent two weeks making it and now we can pivot rather than after you know 10 months of building a product, we learned that nobody wants it. That's 10 months that we wasted on all of that time for everybody. Cons of doing the agile process is that sprints can be really restrictive to the release process. Um, when you're working really fast and great as a team, you're often finishing features every week, every day, uh, and you want to just release those features when it's uh, available to release. So uh, sometimes having to wait for a even a two week or three week sprint cycle uh, can feel like you released something that you worked on ages ago because you've moved past that at this point. So that's where the lean methodology really came in. Um, it focuses on trying to build, measure, and learn as fast as possible. Um, and it doesn't restrict anything by the time process. So we're just trying to make sure that we can build something, measure from it, learn from it, uh, that produces ideas of what to build next. Um, so this loop is highly collaborative. It's um, brought from the manufacturing principles created by Toyota. So it was a manufacturing on Toyota's uh, parts line. Uh, they came up with this idea of working quickly and enabling their teams to um, try to work as fast as possible and brought it over to the technology world and it's worked really well. So pros are it's this further reduces risk associated with working on something that delivers no value. So we're constantly learning at every step of the way. This cycle could be one day. We could come up with an idea, build a really quick prototype, send it out to users, learn from it, and then trash it the next day. Um, you know, we're trying to do this as quick as possible. We are not limited to releasing on a certain day of the week, uh, every other week, anything like that. Uh, we'll release as quickly and as often as possible. Um, the cons to this is this can feel really unstructured and maybe not valuable for a more corporate environment. Um, when you've got, you know, quarterly projections for your revenue and things and you're trying to work as fast as possible like this, it can feel a little chaotic for those business investors or um, those stakeholders at the level that are trying to say, you know what, we're going to have this much more business on this day, or I'm trying to predict our revenue from this. Um, sometimes uh, this amount of churn and tossing ideas out and building new things so quickly uh, can feel a little bit unstructured. Um, but this is my personal favorite methodology for working because it really focuses on um, these seven principles, so eliminating waste, uh, working as clean as possible, 
uh, empowering the team, which I think this is the most important of all of these is it really empowers uh, the team that's working on the product to make those decisions really quickly. Um, so that's kind of the key um, learning from working in a lean environment for so long for the past couple of years is if your team is not empowered, you can't work quickly. If somebody else has to approve literally everything and no one's empowered to make a decision, um, this isn't going to work for you. Uh, but it focuses on delivering fast, uh, optimizing the whole, so making sure everything you deliver is optimized as a whole thing, not just bits and chunks. Um, building quality in, so building it right. Uh, deferring decisions to the last responsible moment is another of my favorites. Uh, if you don't have to make that decision right now, you shouldn't. Um, if you can defer it down the road after you've learned more and can make a better decision later, uh, then you absolutely should. Uh, you don't have to make every single decision right up front for a product. So a lot of times when I'm in meetings, I'll say, hey, this isn't important right now. Let's put it in the parking lot and we're going to make this decision after this point when we know this, which is going to better inform us. Um, and that helps teams, you know, not get derailed on these small decisions that take months to get approval on. And then amplify learning. So everything that we learn, we project out to the rest of the team and it, you know, eventually it helps the rest of the business as well. When you're learning really fast about your customers and what they want um, in your market, then everybody wants these learnings and wants to, you know, um, get value from that. I do have a question. Yeah. So I guess whenever you're um, interviewing or whatnot, how do you know what the team, what kind of uh, format the team works on? Do you just ask them, you know, up front or do you just kind of learn after you get on the team? Yeah, I would say if you're going through an interview, it's a great question to ask. Do you have a, you know, agile methodology or a working methodology for your team of what pace they work in? Um, I think that's probably something that would really impress interviewers uh, and give you a really good idea of, you know, what your work life is going to be like, of how you're going to collaborate with others, the timelines. Do they work in sprints? Do they um, you know, work in a lean methodology? Do they follow the scrum practice? Um, there's so many different ones and you don't have to be educated on all of them, but it's a great question to ask up front. Uh, a lot of employers are looking for people that have agile experience, which uh, I think that y'all do some agile training um, throughout this course, uh, as well as uh, work in a pretty agile environment as you're doing your projects as well. So that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is a great visual for just how we reduce risk by re uh, releasing really often is the red line is we're not releasing very often. The more time that we take between releases, uh, the more risk we're gathering because we're not validating what we're making. Uh, really the only way to truly validate a product is to have people use it and buy it and learn from that. And so the longer you go without that, the more risk you're accumulating versus the green timeline is us releasing often on consistent schedules. Uh, we're going to, you know, build for a while going up, release, and we're going to learn which reduces our risk. So we're validating that effort. We can pivot at any point on those um, small ones, but we're reducing risk over time by releasing quickly and often. So the life cycle of a project. Um, I used to work at a company called Pivotal Labs, and this is still my favorite methodology for how you look at a project as a whole and kind of that uh, life cycle that you go through learning, even not working at Pivotal anymore. Um, I still bring this into a lot of my projects to explain um, just what the best methodology for how you discover what you should be making, uh, validate that, um, scope it down, and then build it. So this is called discovery and framing. Um, this is also called the double diamond approach. It's not just Pivotal's uh, approach. It is um, used kind of widely in the industry, but the idea is these diamonds represent where we're gonna go really wide learning something and then we're going to converge and figure out the uh, 
more identified solution or problem. So for the discovery portion, we're gonna go really wide and say, what are all of the problems that our users are experiencing right now? And we're gonna get a ton of problems that we could solve. And then we're gonna say, okay, what's the most valuable thing to solve right now? Uh, and we're gonna start converging those thoughts to a single problem space that we're gonna focus on. Um, and then we're going to go through the framing. So we're gonna say, okay, how could we solve that problem? And we're gonna think of all of the different ways we could possibly solve it. So maybe we said that, um, you know, we've got communication is our main problem that we wanna solve. Our uh, employees are having a really hard time, you know, trying to communicate with their other um, coworkers. And so we're gonna say, okay, well, we could solve this a lot of different ways. We could implement email, we could implement, you know, phones, we could text message, we could chat, we could video call, um, all of these different solutions. And then we're gonna say, well, what is actually the best way to solve this for what the users are doing and what they want? We're gonna interview a lot of people, talk to them about what they want. And then we're gonna say, you know, this is the best place to start. Let's go with this solution. So diverge and converge for each of those um, going wide and coming back into a really focused scoped area. So after we've got all of that done, development starts, um, we start iterating on uh, what we should be doing and learning throughout the way. We may find that wasn't the best solution. We may find there are 10 more features that somebody wants on top of what we already made and we're going to iterate after that as a product team. So um, what each member of the team does for our three different pillars uh, of a product team, design and product during discovery are really gonna focus on talking to users, interviewing them and stakeholders to understand that problem space. Most of the time, uh, the company knows kind of an idea of what they want, but we're gonna go out and we're gonna talk to tons of users to validate that, to say, this is all that we heard from them to prove that this is the problem space that we're supposed to be in, or we could find out, I've worked on a lot of projects where, you know, we thought we should be doing one thing. We went and talked to users and found out there were 10 more important problems that they really wanted us to address before tackling that. Um, one uh, example is I had a client that knew that they wanted a mobile app. They said, you know, we really wanna launch a mobile app this year. We know we need one. Um, go talk to our users to find out what should be in it. And then we talked to users and really every user said, you know, I love this product, but the support, how you handle support is horrible. And I would really rather see a better support experience before I saw a mobile app. Um, so instead we told them, you know, hey, maybe it's better to prioritize, um, you know, different support features for call centers and things like that over a mobile app right now. Um, so, because, you know, 10 out of 10 users recommended that. Um, developers during this time are going to help define the feasibility of creating the product and identify technical risks. So are there APIs or other product teams that we need to integrate with that are difficult? How can we start outlining that and setting expectations up front, um, creating some of that you know, technical architecture that needs to be defined? During framing, design and product are going to begin deciding what that solution is. This might include uh, wire framing and road mapping um, of what features we're gonna start with, where this is gonna grow and defi defining that solution of, you know, should we make email or, um, you know, AOL messenger. Um, developers are gonna begin defining the framework for the product and do some technical spikes. So some of this could be throwaway code to just start to look into some of the areas that we identified as risks. Um, I had a project that really needed offline capability. So we had a developer uh, for the first two weeks of the project, just trying to figure out how difficult it was gonna be to save and cache information within the browser and then re-upload it as connectivity came back online. So being able to have that kind of offline, offline capability like a Google Drive doc. Um, so that's what everybody's doing during framing. Uh, as we try to define what our MVP is going to be. Uh, this is a really great visual for how I think about it is every product has this pyramid of uh, steps that it goes through as you build a product. So the first you know, bottom pyramid is it is functional. 
it takes a long time. This is the biggest of chunk of time to actually create is just all of the function for something. And then it's reliable. And then on top of that, it's usable. And then on top of that, it's delightful. So there are a lot of experiences that are just delightful, um, that have really great interactions that you just love using, uh, that have no friction points. And you just say, man, that was super easy. But when we get funding for projects, we likely don't have funding for all the way up to delightful. This takes a lot of time uh, and all the functions that you could possibly want. Um, so we try not to use our money that we start our project with to just fill up a lot of features that are barely functional. When we try to define our MVP, we try to take our pizza slice from the top delightful all the way down for a single feature. So nothing that you know started started with every single feature it has. If you think about Google, they started with just a search engine, but they were a great search engine. You know, it's great to use. It's really uh, awesome. It served everybody's needs. And then they started building on top of that. And because you build a lot of trust with your users and your business when you make something that is truly valuable and delightful, it's a lot easier to get that next slice and more money when you made something that does what it does really great, rather than I made a lot of things that kind of do what they were supposed to do. Um, but it's a lot of features, but none of them are particularly enjoyable to use or actually do what they want to do. Um, it's a lot harder to get that next step of money to say, you made a giant product that nobody likes. Okay, here's some more money to make people like it. It's a lot easier to say, I made one thing that does its job so impeccable that people love it. Let me make another thing or let me build on top of that. So that's how we think about where we should define our MVP. What's the smallest thing that's going to provide so much value that people love it and we can do it in the amount of time we have. So the next portion is beginning your build. So product is going to define that roadmap and features for an MVP, building a product backlog of work. So they're gonna start actually putting stories into a backlog. Design's gonna deliver prototype screens for delivery, attaching them to each feature in the backlog. So all of those uh, fancy tools that we talked about, they're gonna use those. And then developers are going to complete their research and usually start to build that path to production. So pipelines, things like that, all of that project start stuff that you have to do right before you can actually start coding something. So here are all of those lovely tools that we talked about. We've got Envision, Sketch, Figma, Zeppelin, Adobe, XD, and Marvel, all of them. Um, Sketch, Figma, and XD are kind of those design tools. The others are tools that you can use to create prototypes. Um, and usually I have these pulled up, but I completely forgot to do it today. Let's see if I can quickly sign into Figma. So I can show you a little bit of this. So Figma is gonna be very similar to any other um, just design tool that's going to be very, uh, you know, greenfield with saying, um, this is what I want to make. So you start with a blank canvas, you say, I want it to be this size. And you literally make text boxes and uh, rectangles and images to build your experience piece by piece. So all of this, and then developers can come in here and see all of these specs so they can see the distance between things, um, what the colors are, what the text sizes are all over here. You get your hex colors. You can see that this is nine pixels away from this text box, uh, things like that. So uh, designers are usually build this portion and then deliver it to the developers to say, this is what I want to make. Uh, here are all of your specs. Um, Envision app is another one of those. Let's see if I can sign into this one quickly. I'm lucky that all of my passwords are just remembered. Um, so this one creates clickable prototypes. So this is also really popular. Um, 
So this looks like it's loading, it loads up, um, it looks like a phone. I can create animations and things like that as well to pop all of this up. Um, go back, I can make menus pop out over the tops of things. Um, but all of these are just pictures. None of this is coded. It was just pictures that I've put together with hotspots, like basically a really fancy PowerPoint presentation that looks like a real thing. But we use this a lot for those user interviews and testing to validate a product. So um, any questions on those tools before I move on? All right. So after that, we start to iterate. Um, so developers are gonna work on those stories provided uh, to release quickly and often. Um, product is going to prioritize and approve work. So constantly adding to that backlog of what we should be doing next. And design is gonna gather feedback on features. So as things are released, we're gonna gather feedback, iterate on the designs and put that new work into the work stream. So that's kind of how all of this looks together. Um, we had asked about timeline, like I said, discovery and framing can take anywhere from four weeks to four months. Um, but those iterations are really decided by each team. These could be two week sprints. These could be, you know, really quick iterations of a week. Um, your timeline for releasing anything and uh, how long discovery is going to take is really just depends on what you're trying to make. If it's a really small app, it could take a couple of weeks to build and do everything. Um, if it's a really big effort, it could take years to actually get to your final version of what you're, you know, fully envisioned for a product. Um, but hopefully you are, you know, talking to users along the way, deciding small scopes and releasing really quickly and often so that you're learning from that as you go along. So balanced teams support each other. We include all of these people because uh, along the way, it really helps to have all of those voices in the room to make sure that we're making something that is valuable for a user and for a business and is technically feasible. And that's the end of my talk. Um, you're absolutely welcome to email me. This is my LinkedIn, please connect with me. Um, I also uh, give every, um, Platoon the opportunity to ask me about their personal projects and their group projects. I've helped a lot of teams scope down things or given de design advice. Um, most people that have come to me for their personal projects have won best in show. So if that tells you anything, um, but I'm happy to help however I can. Um, this is something I'm really passionate about uh, is you know, helping everybody learn and create a, a good project that's good for your portfolio for going out into the field. And also, if you are interested in being a PM or a designer as you come out of boot camp, um, I'm also happy to pass along resources or um, help you, you know, find out how to get into one of those paths as well, if that's something that interests you. But having uh, a boot camp experience and knowing how to code only puts you in a 10 times better place for any of these positions as well. So you are on the right track, even if that's something that you're interested in. So once upon a time, somebody would have been busy writing a user manual. And these days, we used to have to have help screens and stuff like that. What is that, where does that come in? Yeah, so the idea now is that things should be intuitive enough for someone to not have to be trained to use. Um, so that's kind of my goal is that, you know, you should be able to use something without having a huge amount of training on it and having to define a user manual the entire time uh, for every feature that you release and how it uh, integrates with that. Um, but for some things, uh, it's slightly unavoidable. And so we try to build some of that into the experience with those, you know, help pop-ups or maybe guides throughout. Uh, I'm sure everybody's come across one product or another that the first time you log in, it tries to walk you through how to use uh, the application. So if it's something that's particularly difficult, uh, a lot of times we'll build something like that into the experience. Um, 
or I've also worked at companies where we did end up making some user manuals with screenshots of how to do key items uh, because the users really wanted it. They wanted, you know, the PDF of I can search and figure out how to do this thing. Um, so it just depends on the project, but it's a lot less common now to have to put together a manual for how to use software because the hope is that we've made it intuitive and easy enough to use that you don't need to be trained on it. Any other questions? <laughs>